So, Mr. Cooper, you're looking for a job. A menial job. <laughs> like yours. Why, thank you for noticing. I'm menial employee of the month. Do you have a particular field in mind? I do. For thousands of years, the lowest classes of the human race have spent their lives laboring to erect monuments under the lash of their betters, until finally they dropped down and became one with the dust through which they trudged. <laughs> do you have anything like that? No. Shouldn't you check your database? No. You didn't really type. I didn't really have to. So how about construction? Oh, that would be good. Just sawing, hammering, eating out of a lunch pail as my working class fellows and I sit perched precariously on a girder high above the metropolis. No, no, this is putting up sheetrock at a housing project in Rosemead. I could do that. Good. One question. Yes? What's sheetrock? Moving on. How about doing deliveries for a florist? That seems acceptable. Do you have your own car? I don't drive. Of course you don't. Mr. Cooper, let me just ask you a question. What was your last job? Senior theoretical particle physicist at Caltech focusing on M-theory, or in layman's terms, string theory. I see. Just give me a second. Security! All right, so this is the autism paradox. <laughs> and this has been more brilliantly uh, illustrated than I intended it to be. Um, <laughs> just because of all the difficulties we've been having. So, the autism paradox is, simply put, great content and terrible delivery, right? <laughs> Which is kind of what we're encountering. Um, right? Employment is like the number one transition skill that everybody is looking for. But the paradox is just like Dr. Sheldon Cooper there, he's way overqualified for everything he's going for, and yet, can he actually do these jobs that they're trying to get him to do? No, he can't, right? The stats are pretty bad. About 80% of people with autism are not employed. And what's sad is that the very characteristics that make it hard for us to have a job are actually the ones that make us really good employees once we get a job. Um, we have tremendous strengths, right? The accuracy in visual perception, concentration, long-term memory, special interests, being able to do repetitive things over and over and, and do that without getting tired. But because of our social behaviors and our verbal and nonverbal communication deficits, our sensory issues, we often really struggle. If you look at the strengths, right? This is from, this is a really good book. If it's in your uh, resources in the handout, but it's called Asperger's on the Job um, by Rudy Simone. And it's a really great book. But she talks about the research strengths of autism and employment, our focus, our diligence, our pride in the quality and the detail, desire to please, our ability to be creative and think independently. We often can think more rapidly in our interest areas than others can. We tend to be very visual. Um, and again, all those little details, we tend to be very routine oriented, very honest, very reliable. Um, who wouldn't want an employee that can do these things, right? We tend to be able to make more rational decisions than neurotypicals. There are so many researched autistic strengths. And as a result, we should be heavily employed. Recent data suggest it's time to start thinking of autism as an advantage in some spheres, not a cross to bear, says Dr. Matron. Um, as we focus on strengths, there's a lot of great opportunities for employment, and yet these challenges are real. Most of us had some work after high school, but just barely half, right? Just barely over half. Only one in three of us are employed, about one in five working full time. We tend to be underemployed and make very little per hour. And one of the huge scandals is this. We're more likely than the neurotypicals to go into school to study things like science, technology, engineering, and math, right, the STEM fields. And yet, we don't go to college very often. And even compared to other 
disabilities, well, that's nice and loud, even compared to other disability categories, we don't go to college very often. We're the third lowest for college attendance, and we are the lowest for employment. Let me repeat that. For all disabilities you can think of, you are more likely to be employed than someone with autism. <laughs> we have the lowest rate. Even, and if you have autism, if you have intellectual disabilities, you're more likely to have a job than those without it. And yet, when we do have work, and especially if it's work we really can connect with, it improves nearly all autism symptoms to have a job. The bottom line is, we have great potential to work and great strengths that we can be very valuable to an employer with, and we are terrible at getting and keeping jobs, right? So this is the paradox. We would make amazing employees, we often have amazing superpowers, and we just can't seem to get a job that's at our level. Now, as you look at the diagnostic criteria for autism, right, we have problems with social communication, we have problems with repetitive behaviors and interests and sensory stuff. Where on here does it say that we can't have a job? <laughs> Is that, is that an autistic symptom? No, it's not. Now, there's things on here that can make having a job more difficult, but really, we can find a job. Why is it so dang hard, though? What is it that's making it so difficult? What are some things that you've run into that really seem to make it hard to have a job or have that job at the right level? Social interaction, Social interaction is one of the very biggest. What else? Okay, so yeah, we may have comorbid disorders like Tourette's and so forth that give us additional issues that can make it even harder, right? So sometimes we can talk and sometimes we can't and sometimes we say things that other people find offensive. And even if we don't have Tourette's, by golly, we'll tell you bluntly exactly what's wrong with your company and exactly what's wrong with everything and do your bosses tend to appreciate that bluntness? Not, not so much. Um, so we're going to look at some of the big ones that I've seen, um, and there's lots of others, but these are three of the biggest challenges I've seen. One is our tendency to crash and how we deal with the autism crash. Two is the soft skills problems, which speaks to the social deficits. And the last one, because we tend to crash and because we tend to have bad social interactions, we develop a lot of anxiety about work and about trying even to get a job, um, and as a result, we often don't even try. So let's talk about the crash. The autism crash happens in every, it can happen in any situation, but today I'm talking about it mainly in the context of work, right? What it means is that we take on some challenges without really being aware of or acknowledging that we may not be quite up to those challenges, right? We don't really get the supports we need, we don't get the help with planning, decision making, and we take on more than we can handle. As a result, our sensory issues and our social issues start kicking in and we go to the second stage. We start stressing out and hitting the wall. We're overwhelmed. We start procrastinating and avoiding tasks at work. Um, we start doubting ourselves. Am I even in the right job? Did I, was I an idiot? You know, who am I kidding? We get stressed, we get depressed, and we start withdrawing. Now, withdrawing may look like we start showing up to work late, or we don't show up to work at all, or you may have what uh, Dr. Stephen Shore calls the autistic preemptive strike, <laughs> the ape, <laughs> right? The, the autistic preemptive strike is when we're like, oh, cred, this job is getting really hard, and what do we do? We act like we don't even care. Yeah, I don't even care. You can't fire me, I quit, right? We, and we will do that. Because if we don't preemptively quit, if we try to stick it out, and we're still not getting the helps and supports we need, we go to this third stage where, boom. Okay, we hit that bottom and we crash. And after we crash, we have to make the repairs, right? We gotta clean up that mess. We've gotta deal with the fact that we've lost all this time, these money, these resources, we've damaged relationships, we've damaged ourselves. Now everybody does this, but with, with autism, Yeah, we can lose that job, right? That big rig. <laughs> Permanent, pervasive, and personalized. These are Temple Grandin's three Ps that she talks about. And she says, look, with autism, yeah, everybody crashes, but when we crash with autism, we look at it as permanent. Okay, I crashed this once, and it's always gonna be crashed. Pervasive, it's not just this one area, it's my whole life, and personalized. It's not just that I'm bad at work or bad at this job, I'm bad at everything, I'm a bad person. Um, and we tend to do these things. 
And we have a choice to either then give up and dwell in that, or we can adjust and create systems and pick back up. So um, just to give you an example, I graduated with my bachelor's degree. It took me five and a half years to get a bachelor's degree, and I had way too many credits when I graduated. But I graduated with a degree in teaching, and I was sure I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I got a job pretty quickly as a teacher, because in Utah, they're kind of desperate for teachers. And I got into my first classroom, and it was, I was teaching eighth and ninth grade in junior high. And a couple weeks into the semester, I realized this was not going the way that I wanted it to, right? I was the new teacher. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have the relationships with other teachers. I didn't have the classroom supplies I needed. I didn't have my lesson plans all done. And I started getting more and more and more overwhelmed. I started vomiting blood, had all of these horrible, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I lost a lot of weight, but that was the only good thing. Um, all of a sudden, though, about a month into it, I'm not going to go into all the details, I went to talk to my principal and I said, I, I, I can't do this and I have to quit. And it was like the most horrible day of my life employment-wise, and I've had some pretty bad employment days. That was the worst one ever, and I went home and I went into the deepest depression I'd been in in my life to that point. And I was in it for several weeks, and that was that crash, right? I was just totally out. What was I thinking? What am I doing? I spent all this time and money to get this bachelor's degree to go have a job, and now it's blown up. I'm never going to be a teacher. It's never going to work. I, I wasted all this time. I was married at this point, so I'm worried about what is this doing to my wife, and now I've got this debt from my, my education, and what am I going to do? And I kept spiraling lower and lower and lower. And thankfully... I was able to make enough adjustments and create enough systems to start changing it around. And I'll talk a little more about that as we go through. But I'll tell you, if I'd given up there, I would never be where I am today, where I'm a nationally awarded teacher and I love what I'm doing and I'm running a school. But I couldn't see any of that at that side of it. And when we're in that crash, we can't see any of it. So what I'm saying is, is don't give up. Pro tip, you're going to crash your way to success. So the key is to get out of the ditch faster and to figure out ways to avoid that crash and to get a crash helmet so it doesn't hurt so bad when it happens. Because it will crash. We'll crash with relationships. We'll crash with jobs. We'll crash with school. Um, when I meet parents who are like, well, you know, my kid's in, in school and he has autism. And I'm like, oh, cool. How many times has he tried school? And they'll be like, they'll laugh and they'll say, oh, this is his third try or whatever. We do generally crash our way through. But success is on the other side of that crash. So don't give up. Our second challenge is the one that we were talking about with soft skills. Dr. Peter Gearhart talks about how, wait a minute, is this outcome more because of their autism or because they don't have the skills? And so often what we find is, it's not about autism, it's about we just don't have the skills. The good news is we can teach skills, right? Can I get someone to read this quote for me? Anybody? Thank you, go ahead. Thank you so much. That was great. And this is from um, Barbara Bissonnet's um, Asperger's Syndrome Workplace Survival Guide, which is actually also really good. And her bottom line is, it's not your ability at the job to do the job. It's your ability with other people. The most important jobs at work, or most important skills at work, are not your technical skills. It's your people skills. Um, and that can be good and bad. But as we realize that, okay, that's the way the game is played, we can play that game. As you survey employers, they surveyed thousands of employers and they said, okay, this is what we're looking for. We want people with strong work ethic. And we're like, okay, yeah, we got that with autism. Positive attitude. Well, we, we got that sometimes. Good communication skills. Well, yeah, in some sort of situations. Time management, problem solving. Some of us are really good at it. Some of us not. Acting as a team player. 
we, we hate that, right? It's like we're, we're, we're tired of carrying the whole team and we don't want to deal with their problems and our teams tend to do it wrong, right? I mean, God, they're all doing it wrong. Self-confidence is not always something we're great with. Neither is accepting feedback and dealing with criticism. And our flexibility and adaptability is often one of our problems. Working well under pressure, again, some of us are good, some of us struggle with that, and it depends on the situation. But the good news is, with, and then you look at these 10, is there anything on here you can't learn to do? No. And do you have to be great at all of them? No. But the more of them you have, and the better you've worked on it, the more likely you are to be able to get the job and keep it. Um, in Asperger's on the job, she says, look, here are the skills we really need. Making a small talk and tolerating small talk. Learning to curb our bluntness. Um, and these are related, right? Because a lot of our small talk is things like, wow, I hate that band you have on your t-shirt. They're the worst I've ever heard, right? And it's like, with autism, when we're talking to somebody, we're just sharing information, right, to try and be helpful. But people are not looking at it that way. Neurotypicals don't talk just to share information. They talk to share relationships. So when they talk about small talk, what's the point? When a neurotypical starts yakking about the weather or the local sports team, what are, they, what are they trying to convey? What's the message that that small talk is trying to convey? Yeah. Connection. Good. Good. When I say it's connection, because when the person says, like, whoo, it's been really hot lately, you can be like, well, actually, the average temperature at this time of year, you know, we're not helpful there, right? We think we're being helpful, but we're not. What they're saying is, is, wow, I've been experiencing this weather. You've been experiencing this same weather too, haven't you? Let's talk about this thing we have in common, and let's connect with this and acknowledge that we are people who are sharing an experience. And when I realized that small talk was really just the neurotypicals trying to share experiences, I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. They're just wanting to connect with me. All right, I can put up with talking about sports for a little bit, right? One of my things, one of my fixations is watching the news, so... They talk about sports on the news. I can at least use that to talk about sports with these people, even though I could not possibly care less about sports in any situation. Um, but learning to be able to be indirect, instead of, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, avoiding correcting others. Again, I don't know if you've noticed this, but those of us with autism, we are always right, okay? It's just, it's a burden we must bear. But... <laughs> exactly. Um, so we really have to work at not sounding like we're talking down to others. When in doubt, leave it out. If we've got a topic or a detail uh, that we think might be a problem, don't do it. When we do screw up, quickly call it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know what I can be like. When we own it, people are used to that. We talked about getting a mask last hour, um, but at least getting a better screensaver. If our default face looks angry, it's not going to help us get a job or keep moving up. We need to be prepared for the sensory stuff we're going to be in, going into. And we need to be able to realize that a little bit of ritual, a little bit of routine, that's plenty. And we can't be imposing that on, on the other workers. Um, certain people with autism will try and make their whole team always do things a certain way. Uh, it doesn't work very well. We have to learn how to advocate and communicate with the boss, which we'll talk about. And one of the best systems out there for gaining soft skills is to find a mentor, to find somebody who already is doing well at this job or this career that we've got or want and see what they're doing and copy that. Um, Temple Grandin is one of my mentors in some ways, and she said, I'm always getting less autistic because I'm always learning how to play the part of a neurotypical better. It's like I'm always in a play. And again, if you've ever met Temple, does she come across as a neurotypical? No, not at all. But she also isn't coming across in such a way that neurotypicals have problems with her. In fact, they really like her. And that's all you need is to play to that level. So like last hour, we talked about nonverbals. Being aware of what your public perception is. What is the message I'm sending through my clothing? What is the message I'm sending through my expressions, through my gestures, through my voice, my vocal tone? Um, again, if you want that, make sure you watch that or go get that nonverbal handout. Another soft skill then that can be really helpful is developing our emotional intelligence quotient, right? A lot of us with autism, we have high IQs, but we have a really low emotional <laughs> IQ. The emotional IQ actually is more important. It's where you're able to say, all right, I can be aware of my emotions and I can do stuff about them. And I can be aware of others' emotions and I can help influence those. Um, and there's some of this stuff in your handouts, but it's really, there's books about it, there's seminars about it, there's YouTube videos about it. Why? Because this is something neurotypicals struggle with too. But we, all of us can get better at this, at being able to recognize emotions in ourselves and in others 
and to influence emotions in ourselves and in others. You're welcome. Here's another system. This one is from the Ocali Lifespans Transition Center. Um, five important targets, right? You're fit. When you're exploring a job, double check. Is this going to work for me sensorily? Like we were talking about with the glass breaking job, that would not work for me sensorily at all. Sometimes group work is too much and I can't handle that. A lot of people with autism are great at technical skills and yet where do they stick you as soon as you get a job with a tech company? Where do you usually end up? Yeah, in a social situation where you're in a little cubicle with everybody right there or you're in a big group room where this is where everyone collaborates and we have this synergy and it's like, shut up, I just need my own place where I can do this job. Um, but be aware of that, right? Communication-wise, what are the communication demands with this job, and am I going to be able to handle it? How many people in here hate making phone calls? Just talking to people on phone. I've always hated phone calls, so if I had a job where I had to make phone calls all the time, obviously not a good plan. Um, are the activities and the tasks in line with your skills? This is where you really want to shine. Take a job where you know you're going to have deficits in some of these other areas, but you can blow them away by saying, no, no, I've got these tasks, I've got these activities, I can do this. Is this job predictable enough? Some people thrive on unpredictability, but not generally those of us on the spectrum. And are the social demands gonna be okay, right? So this is SCARS, because if we don't watch out for these five, it can create real scars. Another one, self-awareness. I can tell you all this stuff, but you are the world's living expert on you, and my systems may or may not work for you. But if you know yourself and you really know what you want, the goals that you have, the job you want, you can do this. One of the best things you can do to be aware of yourself and to increase your self-awareness is to increase your exposure. A lot of us with autism, what kind of jobs do we all want to do? What's the stereotypical autistic jobs that everybody's like, oh, people with autism would want to be blank? Yeah, we all want to go to computers. What are some of the others? Yeah, math. Gaming, something with video games. Okay, yeah, something like firefighting or like public, public service kind of stuff, right? Um, even teachers occasionally, like me. Why? Why are those the jobs that we're always saying we want? Oh, I want to be a writer. I want to be a YouTube star. Why? Because that's what we've been exposed to. A thousand years ago, people with autism, what were they exposed to? Farming. And, yeah, well, a thousand years ago, they weren't even usually in the institutions. They were out in the hills doing whatever, but they were farming, right? So their special interests were all things like raising better cattle, or building a better fence, or getting more yield out of that corn, or whatever it happened to be, and that was great. But nowadays, we're not exposed to a lot of those things, and it makes Temple Grandin really mad about how there's all these thousands and thousands of jobs out there that people with autism could be great at, like machinists and welders and composite material specialists that we're not even exposed to, so we never do them. What you're gonna have to do as you know yourself is figure out your unique employment, right? Autism's a disorder of extremes. We tend toward being an outlier. So if this was normal jobs here in the middle, the jobs everybody else does, we have some overlap with that, but we also will do jobs that no one else wants to do, but they're really appealing to us, or jobs that everyone else wishes they could do, but they usually don't have a shot at. For instance, I had a student who, his, his autistic fixation was death, which is really dangerous, by the way. Um, but thankfully, it wasn't killing and it wasn't guns, it was just death. And guess what? There's a lot of jobs in the death field that no one else wants to do. Like what? Mortician. Someone has to collect those organs from the organ donor bodies. Dealing with, more, with um, anatomy labs. Being the person that's like timing the corpse to see when the maggots burst out for the, the, all of the wonderful um, and, uh, autopsy people and stuff. And guess what? He loved those kind of jobs and was able to find employment really quickly. Um, on the other hand, you have... Other things. So on the one side of the extremes, you have the four Fs. Food, filth, flowers, and filing. These are those entry-level jobs where we're dealing with, with food, with custodial, with landscaping or plants, um, with data processing or really basic stuff like that. Is there anything wrong with these jobs? No, especially if you like this stuff. And by the way, our entry-level jobs, that's, they tend to be these areas. What I'm saying is, is don't limit yourself to them, but we tend to be on that side. Um, or we tend to be on the other. Here's um, Made by Brad, he's got his own website. This is a really fascinating way to use your autistic strengths. Um, Brad's totally nonverbal, but he's got his own business.
This is Brad. Brad has autism. He likes to spin. It makes me feel dizzy, but it makes him feel better. Brad can't speak, so he uses simple sign language to communicate. This is Brad's dad, Mark. He's a pilot. He's always pushed Brad to be the best he can be. Whenever Brad visits, he comes in, he unloads the dishwasher, he shaves with his dad, he makes lunch, and after they eat, he builds something. He's been building things for years. You see, even though Brad can't read, he can understand any diagram, no matter how complex. The pistons go up and down. Oh, wow. When you turn the wheels. He's given the box, he opens the box, he opens the instructions, and uh, it doesn't matter what kind of thing it is, you notice these are all really different. Brad built all these models and the table underneath them. You see, for Brad, furniture is just like any other model or Lego set. In fact, Brad has gotten so good at this that his dad is helping him start a business. Because a lot of us don't like putting together the furniture that we buy, but Brad does. No matter how complicated, he can put it together. Perfect. Brad's dad wants him to have something that he can contribute. He wants him to feel a sense of accomplishment and to be viewed for what he really is, capable and dedicated. Brad, what value he adds is that people buy stuff that has to be assembled. And guess what? Nobody likes to put that stuff together, right? You go down to Ikea or wherever. And so what they do is they hire Brad. He comes in. He has a little script he shows them that says, hi, I have autism. I can't talk, but I can put this thing together. Please show me what you want put together and show me the instructions, and I will take it from there. And he puts it together perfectly. It looks exactly like it's supposed to. It's all right there, and he does it so fast. And he loves it, and he makes good money doing it because nobody wants to do that, right? So that's one side of the extremes. Again, getting creative. The other side of the extremes is those, again, those jobs that everybody else wishes they had. Now, these are diagnosed adults with autism, and I call them the Walmart cluster, and not because they work at Walmart, not that there's nothing wrong with that, but these are writers, like Pulitzer Prize winner Tim Page, again, diagnosed adults with autism, actors like Oscar winner Anthony Hopkins, leisure and recreational people like Satoshi Tajiri, who invented Pokemon, musicians like Derek Parvacini, the human iPod, or artists like Stephen Wiltshire, the human camera, research and educational people like Nobel Prize winner Vernon Smith, and tons and tons of computer programmers, doctors, accountants, history teachers, um, engineers, people who have really technical kind of niche-based employment. Anytime you go there, you're more likely to find people with autism. Yeah. These are all known diagnosed autistics. Yes. Yeah. It's like they know they have autism. They've been officially diagnosed. Um, and so here's, for instance, here's Daryl Hannah. She's the actress who was in Splash and in Kill Bill and stuff. Um, and she started talking more about her autism as she's come out here. She played the should awkward girl who hid behind the glasses in the blockbuster can. Steel Magnolias. We should all be rejoicing. But this morning, Daryl Hannah reveals that shyness right on screen wasn't all an act. I was shy. In People magazine hitting newsstands today, the actress says as a child, doctors diagnosed her with autism. And because of the disorder, she has suffered from debilitating shyness most of her life. She tells the magazine, I've never been comfortable being the center of attention. It's always freaked me out. Hannah says even as her career took off, she couldn't bring herself to do talk shows or attend movie premieres, saying not because I was above it, 
but because I was terrified. It's something that she has managed better as she's gotten older because she's much more confident. As a child, Hannah says she rocked incessantly, a common symptom of autism, and she says she still does. Doctors even recommended she be institutionalized, but she says her school teacher mother refused. Hannah found comfort in watching old movies and eventually moved to Hollywood, making a splash playing that beautiful blonde mermaid. Acting is not a surprise career move for an individual with autism. The predictability that an acting environment will bring is highly desirable for an individual who's on the autism spectrum. Today, at 52, Hannah spends much of her time as an environmental activist. Earlier this year, she was arrested outside the White House protesting the Keystone Pipeline. She tells People magazine, I wasted so much time scared, self-conscious, and insecure. She may have spent a career in hiding, but not anymore. For Good Morning America, Cecilia Vega, ABC News, Los Angeles. Um, what are some things that stood out to you as you hear about Daryl's story and, and her career in Hollywood? What are some things that stood out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was, back in the day, it was like, oh, your child should go to a mental institution, right? Yeah. And she was very, very shy. Now, what happened as she's gotten older? It's gotten better and she's dealt with it better. Autism tends to get better with age. And I've seen that in my own life and in the lives of my students. But um, what did they say about acting in autism? Anybody catch that? They're great together. They, yeah, they fit well. It's not a surprise career move. Why? What's, what's the advantage of like acting versus normal social stuff? Yeah, we're already acting all the time. We're autistic. And then they actually gave us a script, right? And so how many of you in here did drama or any of that stuff or had interest in acting or drama when you were kids. A lot of us do that kind of thing. For Daryl, that was her obsession. She would stay up late at night and watch old movies. She had no friends, um, but she would memorize how all the actors and actresses did stuff. And then she knew she wanted to be a Hollywood actress, which again, most people never get to do. She was able to go and do that because of her determination and her focus. Um, so what I'm saying is employment for people with autism is going to be just as, as unique as we are. There's no one job that's like the autism job. Your unique employment is gonna be that grouping of what you love to do, what you're good at doing, which these are two things that are not always the same. So what we have the skills for, what we have the supports for, things like transportation, um, and what people are gonna pay us to do. And if we can find that intersection, if you can get at least three of these four, that's a good job, that's a good match. Um, but it's gonna be unique to that person. Anybody in here have a really unique job that you're like, oh, I just found this thing. I'm doing this. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm the Lego so the Lego engineers, most of whom are autistic, but they design the Lego sets, right? Yeah. Uh, printing, and modeling, and designing. Good. Okay. So 3D printing is amazing. And yeah, the programs now for that is amazing. Yeah. Custodial will clean up after, after kids, autistic kids, and clean up poopy toilets. Right, okay, so who's willing to clean up poopy toilets? Well, there's someone with autism who is, okay? I did that job for years, and it was like sensorily a little bit much for me yeah. at times, but it also reminded me of why I was trying to go to college, but my dad was a custodian for a long time, and he loved it, and it was fine, and nothing wrong with that. So if you're gonna find a unique job, you need to work on your unique skills, and you're gonna need to find your unique employ uh, approaches. This will require you to create systems. The biggest autistic strength is in systems, Syst systemic thinking, creating systems, and applying systems. That's what our brains love to do. So you're gonna need internal systems, right? Things that will, programs we can run in our heads that will help us with our choices and our actions. And we'll need external systems, meaning other people that we can utilize to help us achieve our goals. Because we're not doing it all alone. It doesn't work that way. And thankfully it doesn't. Now, one of the biggest skills we're gonna need is interview skills, right? How many people in here feel like they're not so great at interviews? Okay, most of us with autism, the interview is about the worst thing ever. Um, there are, however, do's and don'ts that we can master. If we had time, I'd watch this video here where they talk about a lot of the don'ts. Um, but one of the biggest tips I can give you with interviews is to know you're in the interview to sell yourself. And so you come in with a script, you come in with, here are my points that this is how I'm gonna to add to your business, this is how I'm going to help. 
work those into all your answers. Now, if at all possible, don't even interview. There are more and more ways now to get a job without interviewing. What are some ways to do that? How do you get around it? By working for them like as a volunteer or something ahead of time. What, sorry, networking, sorry, and networking. If you know the right people, you can get hired. If they're like, oh, I know this kid and he's great at this, they'll bring you in without an interview sometimes if you're a known quantity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, so even just getting involved with that company in some way and making those connections often can get you through the door without an interview. Yeah. Without an interview? Mm -hmm. Live at the company first and work for them. Good. If, good. If you can do anything to get through, um, those are ways to skip it. And there's other ways. Anybody know how Temple Grandin got her job? Her big job? Yeah. She, she pitched her portfolio. Okay, she brought in, nobody wanted to talk to her, she was terrible at talking, but she came in and showed them, here's what I've done, here's what I've designed, here's what I'm doing, and they're like, you, you're in, <laughs> because we need that. Um, there's a lot of cool techniques you can use, like video modeling, where you tape yourself trying to answer interview questions and watch that. Anybody know what power posing is? This is Amy Cuddy's research out of Harvard. Look up, uh, look up power posing on YouTube, and there's a TED talk where she talks about her research. And what they did is they, they, everybody stand up for a second if you want to be a part of this. Just stand up for a second, show the power pose. Imagine you are a superhero, and I want you to, in, at the count of three, I want you to strike that pose, okay? You're the superhero, you've just saved the entire world. One, two, three, boom, right? Now, they did a research, it's hard, right? Your brain starts going, this is ridiculous. But after a few minutes, your brain goes, we rock. This is, we're, we're the best. And what's funny, go ahead and sit down if you want. But if you can power pose, they did studies where they had people power pose for just a few minutes before they went into a job interview. And they had those groups and they had groups who did not power pose. And they, the people doing the interview did not know which group was which. And then they had remote people watching the interviews who had no idea what was what. And they didn't even hear the interviewer's questions. And at the end they said, who are you gonna hire? And the people who were power posing inevitably scored three or four times higher at being hired than the, the people who had just kind of sat there and done nothing. So even just power posing, these tricks that can help your brain be able to say, oh yeah, I can do it. One of the things you have to think of is disclosure, and we'll talk more about that. Now, one last thing before we get off interviews. Life is not fair. It would be awesome if job people, if the, if the employers, the people offering the job could actually just see us as people it would be awesome if they would just accept us as we are. It'd be awesome if they understood autism, if they understood our weaknesses, but that's really not how it works. And even if they say, oh yeah, I've got, you know, I understand autism, a couple things. We only have one chance really to make that first impression. And when we're making that first impression, they're not gonna cut us much slack because the first impression actually takes place in just a few seconds subconsciously with that person. And so in those first few seconds, we've gotta check their boxes. We've gotta give them what they're expecting. Well, what kind of things are neurotypicals expecting socially when you walk into an interview? Yeah. Eye contact. Eye contact. Eye contact, yeah. Well, good, a warm expression on your face, a smile, yeah. A sincere smile. Yeah. What are they expecting appearance-wise? Professional dress, right? Appropriate for the job. Good, they want a handshake, okay? Knew a guy with autism and OCD, he hated having his hands touched, and it was disgusting for him. And guess what? Tough. <laughs> he had to learn to be able to like, desensitize himself enough that he could go in there and shake a hand for an interview. And then as soon as he got out of the interview, pulled out his, his alcohol rub and just put that hand sanitizer on and felt a lot better. But you've got to give them what they expect socially because every time we give them something they don't expect socially, it creates a barrier. And that barrier is something you're gonna to have to get through later and it's gonna be hard. And it may not be possible because the interview may be as far as we get. So a general rule of thumb, speaking of not breaking their expectations, I generally don't disclose to anybody until they know me. And even then I'm very careful about it. Now I've met some people who do disclose in their job interviews and it works for them okay, but my general rule is generally don't. However, you probably do wanna disclose eventually. Partly because if you don't disclose, is there, does your employer have to do anything for you? No. This is no longer the IDEA that you're under when you're in school. 
once you're out. Right, but, but you only have, but you have to disclose it. If you don't tell someone you have it, they don't have to do anything about it. And so if you do need help or accommodations, or if your challenges are getting in the way of your career, that's when you may need, may need to disclose, right? If you are performing adequately or, appear, or you're appearing just like everybody else, you may or may not want to. Now this is all in your handouts, but if you decide, okay, this is the time I need to disclose, you need to ask yourself, well, what is the need? What is it that really is the problem that needs to be addressed? What would be the best time to disclose that? And how, who do I disclose it to? When, where, what do I actually say, right? So let me show you a system that works really, really well for, that I've taught to hundreds of students. And this is partial disclosure. And this is the snow system, right? Um, situation, need, outcome, who, when, what, how. Basically this says, all right, what is the situation that's causing a need for some type of accommodation, something that requires me to disclose? Um, and then what do I actually need to disclose? What outcome am I aiming for? And who, what, when, how am I gonna disclose this? So let me give you an example. So when I started here at Scenic View, I actually wasn't diagnosed with autism. Didn't even actually know about high functioning adult autism because I had grown up at a time where that wasn't a thing. Um, wasn't even in the DSM until I was out of high school. But I still had situations where I had a need for accommodation. For instance, when I got into this job, they hired me as a teacher, but then very quickly, a couple weeks in, they were like, oh, and we need you to come and do a driver's test so you can drive this great big huge little bus we've got and drive the students around to activities. Yes, you gotta buy the, drive the big rig. Guess how much I wanna drive the big rig? <laughs> Not at all. So anybody in here with autism that loves driving? Okay, my dad loves driving, but I am one of those people with autism that like, if I'm out on the road, it's my driver's test all over again, and it's always new, and it's always different, and I hate doing it if there's other people in the car. My kids have learned, you don't want to go driving with dad, right? Because I'm always that like, everyone be quiet, shut dad's going to drive, don't make me come back. I'm just, I am not a fun person to drive with, because I'm focused on, there's all these changes, it's always different weather, different songs on the radio, different people in the cars, different cars on the road, I can't control those other cars. It's crazy. So my situation is crap, they're asking me to drive. What do I need? I need them to not have me drive. <laughs> I need to have someone else doing it. The outcome, I wanna still keep my job, but not have to drive. Who do I talk to, when, what, how? Well, I was able to go to them and say, look, um, I love being here. I love teaching. Yes, you've been really great. We're glad you're here as a teacher. Um, I grew up on an island in Alaska, <laughs> and I'm, Driving is not something I'm super comfortable with, especially in a big vehicle with a lot of people. But I could be that person that sits in the back with the students. I love being with the students. Could you like make sure other people drive and I'll just be that support person? And thankfully they'd seen enough of my other work that they were like, yeah, sure, who cares? You know, you're a teacher. We don't need you to drive. And I was like, shoo, and I had been like up for a week worrying about this. Um, but because I was able to use this, it was great. The bottom line with disclosure, Fake it, make it, or disclose at some level. If you can look like you're doing it right, and, and they, they appreciate it, or if you can actually do it, you're great. But if not, you've gotta disclose at some level. And that's the key is at some level, right? Disclosure generally doesn't look like, like this, right? So uh, Nathaniel, I mean, you're my boss and everything, and I, I really respect you, um, but I've been needing to tell you I have, I have um, Asperger's syndrome, which um, is named for Dr. Hans Asperger, who was a Nazi scientist in World War II, and in the 1940s, he worked with these kids, and some of these kids, they said, well, they had schizophrenia, but these other kids, they were like, well, they had, something's wrong with them, but it's not schizophrenia, and so to save him from Adolf Hitler, um, Asperger, he went and he created this new diagnosis, it was called uh, Asperger's, which is like a high-functioning autism. Are you familiar with autism? Okay, again, what's happened to poor Nathaniel, my boss, at this point? No, 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 right? I don't need to disclose all of autism. Do I even need to say the word autism? No. Just like when I was talking about the driving, I never said autism. I didn't even know I had it at the time for sure. I was starting to suspect because I'd been hanging out with our students enough and reading up on it and going, let me borrow that book. But, um, but I didn't know for sure. Um, the at some level is key. Most of the time you just need to share one little tiny thing, right? So there's some examples in your handouts where it's like, oh, hey, you know, I've been really, I've been hitting those goals that you gave me, 
but um, I've noticed there's a lot of noise. Would it be okay if I wore my headphones and listened to music while I worked? I could even get higher results for you and get more stuff done more quickly if you'd let me wear headphones. A lot of your employers are going to be like, yeah, sure, who cares? That's great. You know? Anybody have an experience where they were able to dis disclose a tiny bit of their autism and get the result they wanted? Think about it, because I'll bet you do. Then once we've got the job, right, and we can disclose, the, again, through your packet, it talks about the advantages of disclosing before the interview, during the interview, after the interview, or not at all. We've got to keep the job. And once we've got the job, we need to be productive, dependable, and have the right communication. And our focus really has to be social skills. Practice those social skills. See if you can see yourself, like film yourself if you can. Yeah. Practice in the mirror, whatever it happens to be. Evaluate, repractice. So here's one of the systems that I've used a lot. This is called gift wrapping. Which feedback do you want to get? This feedback over here or this feedback over here, right? So often, we want to give direct feedback. So um, one of our librarians we had here at Scenic View, I oversee all the teachers here. Um, she was autistic, and she was our librarian, and she rocked as a librarian. But she also, this is what would happen if anybody had a late book. They would get an email that said, you have a late book and are going to be fined for this, 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 and this if you do not get it back immediately, blah, 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 blah. And if that email didn't work, she would come right to them, and she would be, you have a book out. Your book is over. Yeah, exactly. And you want to just punch her, right? It feels like you're getting hit, right? Because that directness is there. Guess what happened to our library usage? Just dropped off a cliff until she started doing this, where she would say, thank you so much for patronizing our library. I super appreciate that you have checked out three books. You may or may not, as you may or may not be aware, they were due on this date. And if you'll bring them back, we can actually give forgiveness up to this point. But if not, we may have to give you some type of fine. If you could please come talk to me. If you have any questions, I would love to help you. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Blue, things went way back up. Not going to go through this, but this is a self-advocacy flow chart that um, they teach in our transition classes. This is a time management system called ROPES, where you learn to remain flexible and focused, organize, prioritize, economize, and streamline um, to get things done. You'll need systems for time management, being able to stay on task or to get off of a task when it's time to go to a meeting or go to do something else that needs to be done. Um, you'll need systems for anxiety, right? How many of you experience anxiety on the job, right? It's a big deal. Um, when I first, one of the problems we often have with autism is when we get on a job and we're, we do keep it and we're really good at it, what is the next thing our boss or our company wants to do for us? promote you, and that means you get to be a manager. So now you go from just focusing on this job you love to do to, crap, now I've got to deal with people and be in charge of them. And when I, they promoted me to manager, I was like, yes, this is great. And I started having panic attacks. And it was one of the first times in my life I had real severe panic attacks. Every time I was going to go to a meeting, my heart would start racing and my stomach would feel terrible. And it was like, oh my gosh, I, I can't handle it. We can't have these meetings. So I'd make excuses and skip the meeting or skip the supervision. And does that help you as a manager? No, it doesn't. So I started doing research because that is something I'm good at. And I came up with this one. I stole this system from, I um, can't remember who I stole it from. But it's a great system. You need systems for anxiety, right? This one was a breathing system where I would just go in. It's like, oh, I'm having a panic attack. I'm not going to fight it. Let's panic. Come on, brain. Let's just finish panicking so we can go in there and have this meeting. And I'd take a deep breath. I'd picture something really calming. I'd tell myself, I got this. Breathe out. Do that four or five times. Yeah, the ocean is actually what I picture. I'm up on a mountain looking out at the sea. Waterfall. And that's self-talk. There's no danger here. I got this. Thanks, anxiety. I'll be okay. And then I'd distract and get into that meeting. And if I needed to make an excuse and leave that meeting partway through, I would, but I'd get back as quick as I could. And guess what? I still hate meetings but I don't have panic attacks anymore. You'll need systems for anxiety. You'll need systems for communication. This is a two communication, right? Where you need to get a result, right? So this is the secret. Smile and greet, eye contact, context, request, input, expectations, thank and leave. It looks like this. You're just like, oh, hey, um, you know, I'm giving this presentation next hour and I need a pen because I've got to sign autographs. So I didn't bring one. Would there be any chance I could borrow a pen from you and get it back to you before the movie? 
And boom, yeah, you get a pen and it's that easy. And you say, thank you so much. And you take the pen and leave and you make sure you actually give it back. This is in your handouts, but you'll need systems for this kind of two communication where you're just trying to get something. But you're also gonna need situations for improving the, uh, systems for improving the relationship. So this is the with system. I'm gonna go through very, very quickly because we're almost out of time already, which is crazy. Watch yourself. If you think you might be offending, don't do it. Treat them at least as well as you wanna be treated and have a positive attitude and affect. So the W is watch yourself. When you're with the people around you, be with them. Be aware of how you're with them. Be aware of how they're perceiving you. Be aware of their verbals and nonverbals, your own verbals and nonverbals. And try to help them do the majority of the talking. While you're talking, if you're worried about anything, don't do those things, right? Don't tell that joke. Don't share that um, experience. Don't contradict their opinions or start talking about politics or religion or money. Um, one of the biggest things I see people with autism lose jobs for is harassment. Harassment. They get busted for harassment. Anybody know the difference? Sometimes sexual harassment. And we'll talk about more about this next hour, but what's the difference between harassment and flirting? The eye of the beholder. It's how the other person perceives it. And so the key with harassment is it's unwanted. So you may, as the person with autism, do exactly what someone else did or tell that exact same joke or use that same word and get fired. As you get to know the person better, you can do more stuff, but again, think before you talk, right? Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, kind? If it's not, don't share it. T is to treat those people better than you want to be treated. If you get a job, my, my uncle has autism and one of his keys, he always had a job. He said, whenever I get on a job, I would find the thing no one else liked to do that everybody else hated doing and I would get good at that thing. Because guess what? When you're going to go layoffs, do you lay off the guy that does the thing no one else will do? No, no, that person gets promoted. <laughs> you, don't do, you don't get rid of that person. Treat them even better than you'd want to be treated. Always try to leave them with a positive impression of you. So even if you have to give someone some feedback or you've maybe messed up a little, try to leave them with a smile or leave them joking. Even if you can't handle it very long, um, one thing I've learned with people I supervise is I'll just like drop in, smile, ask them a couple little small talk questions. That's all I can handle. But guess what? They don't have time to do a whole lot of that either. And then I leave. And I've left them with a good impression. I've made a good connection. And they think good things. We talked about this last hour, but if you, a quick system for nonverbals, this is the FBI's system for dealing with people and creating instant um, connection. You wanna flash the eyebrows up, smile that genuine smile, tilt your head, keep your chin down and keep your hands visible, or give them a little friendly touch. Um, this creates rapport very quickly. Um, and there's more at bodylanguageproject.com. We talked about this last hour too. Make sure as you're around other people, relaxed, open posture, active listening, good eye contact and sincerity. If you're just playing that role all the time as a default, okay, so I'm gonna sit. Even if I'm having panic attacks and I'm just feeling like this, I've gotta sit relaxed. Yeah. I'm gonna open up and I'm gonna try and smile when I can, make some eye contact when I can. And then the group is like, oh yeah, I'm not scared of him. So those are all internal systems. You'll also need external systems like Voc Rehab um, and those kind of things. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. I'll answer your questions afterwards if you want. There's a lot in your packet about Voc Rehab. Who's used Voc Rehab in here? If you have a diagnosed disability, Voc Rehab is a wonderful program that will, for free, do all kinds of things for you. My younger brother with autism got his entire college career paid for through Voc Rehab. Um, so again, look at Voc Rehab. It's a great system. Um, and if you have social security, you're automatically in. Other external systems, there's all kinds of great assessments that you can use to help find out more about yourself, your career interests. Um, there are free employment toolkits. There are things you can use to help educate your employers. There's resources throughout Utah, and there's even places like Scenic View where we do these trainings for you. Um, but those are all in your handouts. Let me talk about the last challenge here, the fear of failure, because this is what I want to leave you with. Learned helplessness is what happens to elephants, right? When you're an elephant and you weigh 4,000 pounds, um, is this little steak gonna be able to hold you? No. But what they found with elephants is when they're a little tiny elephant and they put a chain on the leg and stake it into the ground, they'll pull against it and they can't get it out and they'll stop pulling. When they're an adult, you put them on the little chain and you put them on the stake, they never even try to pull that thing out because they know they can't do it even though obviously they can. We all do this. Can I get someone to read J.K. Rowling's quote here? The author of Harry Potter. 
Yeah. Loud voice, Alan. <laughs> Good. We hate failing. Everybody does. It's painful. But without being willing to fail, we're not going to succeed because success is on the other side of failure, just like it's on the other side of the crash. So failure was one of my biggest fears and one of the things I had to do to redefine failure. So this is my definition of failure currently, which is I only fail if I give up on something that I still really truly want in my life. Make your own definition, right? So I'm not failing if I don't get what I want. It's just a data point. Okay, what do I learn from this and how do I adjust and what do I move on to next? If you're struggling with this stuff or if you're struggling with failure, the key is not to just stop. The key is to make more decisions, to fail faster, to keep falling down and getting up because that's how we learn how to do this. So I got up in the summer and I worked construction one summer, which is one reason swear words don't bother me at all. And um, working... They don't bother me at all because I worked construction in Alaska for a summer. I sucked at it. I was terrible. I failed at almost everything they asked me to do. I did not swear out loud. Um, but, the, um, but what I found is, is as I failed and failed and failed at this job, I had to create systems so quickly and they were able to keep me on and it worked. I loved Neil Gaiman when he went and he gave his, um, his commencement address and he said, to the students, go make interesting mistakes, make amazing mistakes, make glorious and fantastic mistakes, leave the world more interesting for your being here. We're so often so worried about making mistakes, and we don't need to be. Temple Grandin, today I have a successful career designing livestock equipment because my high school science teacher used my fixation on cattle shoots to motivate me to study psychology and science. Some of the most successful autistics have directed their childhood fixations into careers. Are you gonna have a job? Yeah, you will. You're gonna have to learn the soft skills, you're going to have to ask for needed accommodations. You're going to have to try and find the right environment. And you're going to want to align that with your strengths. But guess what? So do the neurotypicals, right? Everybody has to do this. The studies are now showing that adults with autism are getting more and more employed. Many of them are even getting married. Most of them are living independently. The, the tide is turning and that last and lowest independence is changing. Uh, uh, unemployment thing is changing. So again, don't give up on employment. It is a critical piece of your identity as an adult. Um, people ask you your name, and then what's the next question they always ask you? What do you do, right? So don't deny yourself or your child this critical need. Those of us with autism, we are tragically underemployed, and we often don't even have a chance. But if we're prepared to deal with the crash, if we're learning soft skills, and if we're willing to keep failing forward and find those custom solutions, we can have employment. Find what you're good at in lots of different environments. It's called discovery. And those discovery activities can allow you then to say, OK, I'm good here. What systems will allow me to take that strength and turn it into a career? And then create and follow those systems that will allow you to succeed at work. And never give up. Now, you've all heard the saying, if at first you don't succeed, Try, try again, right? Okay, well, I appreciated your time here, and I'm going to go walk outside and get some air because there's a lot of this, and so, okay, that didn't succeed, but if at first, right, try, try again, and I'm going to keep... What's wrong with this approach? It's this, I'm trying it the same way. If at first you don't succeed, adjust, adjust again, right? Okay, well, that's locked, and that didn't work at going outside, and that didn't work. Okay, and now, but uh there we go. Anything you want in life, know what you want. Take action toward it. Notice what's working and what's not working and keep adjusting till you get it and you can get it. If you're someone with autism and you're here today, you can have a job and it can be amazing and you can build it into more and more and more. Don't worry if that first job isn't your dream job. Nobody gets their dream job on their first try. Keep getting lots and lots of jobs and that's when it's gonna come. And you'll either find that dream job or you'll find that you've fallen in love with the job you have and life is good, right? Thank you so much. Any quick questions? We have like five minutes. Any more hand handouts? I've got lots of handouts because I didn't know how many to make. So if you need extra handouts, please come grab them. Um, anybody else? Questions, comments? I apologize for the technical difficulties. I went through this a little. I had to be flexible. I had to keep adjusting. 
It's going to bug me tonight, but that's okay. Yes. Remember the joke at the beginning? Yes, the big rig. Yeah. It's like that. And it's also like what often happens with autism where when it breaks down, we have no backup plan. So whatever systems you're creating, that's a great point. We've got to remember to have a backup plan, a backup piece for that built in. All right. Thank you guys so much. If you want to stick around, we're going to talk about sexuality and relationships and dating and stuff next hour. And that'll be super fun. So <laughs> we'll see you then. If not, take another, take some time to go to another session. And we got one session left today. That's it. It's crazy. Otcon's already coming to a close.